You're going to give a summary for people who have not read the book. Yes, actually. What I'm going to do, basically, is go through Dante, his life. Mostly the Inferno, because I don't care about the rest of the Divine Comedy, but I'll sort of vaguely tell you what goes on. And then spend a little bit of time in the Italian, because Italian is win. So basically, Dante Alighieri. He was born somewhere in 1265 in Florence, we think. We don't know exactly when he was born. It's not really important. Um, all right, and Florentine politics are really confusing, but they're also important to understanding what's going on with Dante and with the Inferno. So I will kind of give you a really, really short version. Basically, at this point in Florentine history, there are two important political parties, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. And basically, the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor have been having issues for a long time, as I'm sure many of you know. And the, uh, let me be sure I get the parties right, right. The Guelphs are pro-Pope, and the Ghibellines are pro-Holy Roman Emperor. And they are fighting in Florence at this time. Now, this matters because Dante was basically born to the fam a father who was with the Guelphs, and somehow managed to survive the Ghibellines, Ghibellines sorry, being in power in Florence at the time. I'm not clear exactly, you know, how this worked out, because they tended to, every time a power, a different party came into power in Florence, throw everyone else out or kill them. And um, when he was nine years old, Dante fell in love with a girl called Beatrice without ever actually talking to her, and this is important. However, he married someone else random and had kids with them, because that was how they did. <laughs> and we will come back to her later, because... Oh, yes, <laughs> well. yes. Um... Basically, Dante's life. He uh, fought for the Guelphs during a very important battle against the Gil Ghibellines, and it turned to be a big, big victory somewhere around, like, uh, 1289. They drove the Ghibellines out of Florence, and that stuck, and the Guelphs took over. And Dante entered, actually, the Guild of Physicians and Apothecaries, though there's no evidence he ever actually practiced, because you couldn't really participate in public life in Florence if you weren't part of a guild. So Dante wanted to sort of take part in the political life, because that was what everyone did in the tiny republic where it was really contentious. And, um, basically, Dante became a leader in what they called the sort of Dolce Stil Novo, or the Sweet New Style, with a bunch of other very well-known, you know, Italian, like, writers and artists, like, um, this guy called Guido Cal Calvacchetti, Lapo Gianni, Cino di Pistola, and one guy, Brunetto Latini, who we will run into later in, um, The Divine Comedy. And so, basically, life is going fairly well for Dante for a while. Uh, Dante's love for Beatrice is sort of supposed to be this like classic courtly love, pure love from afar. Don't we actually meet Guido in the Commedia? Um, I think we, we do. do meet Guido point. briefly, but Latini is more interesting. But yes, we do. We meet a lot of his friends in Heaven and Hell. <laughs> we don't meet many in Purgatory. It's kind of one or the other. But um, shows us his real feelings about them. No, it's more complicated than that. Shut up. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so Dante loves Beatrice, and he writes a lot of love poetry about Beatrice. She dies in 1290, and Dante's grief stricken. He's spoken to her maybe three times. Um, all right, so they defeat the Ghibellines, and then the Guelphs split into the blacks and the white. And it's basically the same fight all over again. Dante was a white. They wanted more freedom from the Pope and the authority in Rome, and the blacks were like, the Pope, he should run everything. Um, at first, the whites were, you know, ascendant, and they expelled all the blacks from Florence, and they were running everything, and it was great. Then, as usual, France threatened to intervene, because France is always threatening to intervene in Florentine politics. Basically, Florence sort of thought the Pope was planning some kind of occupation of Florence, maybe using the brother of the King of France, who was kind of wandering around sketchily with an army. And so basically, <laughs> they decided to send, you know, a delegation to Rome to find out what the Pope's intentions, because the Pope, at this point, the, he's very influential in Italian politics in a military as well as spiritual sense. And um, Dante was among the people sent in a delegation from Florence. Um, the Pope basically threw everyone else in the delegation out almost immediately and only asked Dante to remain. Um, the French then and did indeed march with the rest of the Black Guelphs on Florence. They wrecked a lot of the city, killed most of their enemies, and took power. Dante was sentenced to uh, two years of exile and a very large fine, which was a problem because the Pope ordered him to stay in Rome, meaning that he was an absconder. He couldn't go pay the fine. He was stuck there. And he also was unwilling to pay the fine, didn't think he'd done anything wrong, and unable to since they had seized all of his assets in Florence. He had no money and couldn't go home to pay the fine, and he wouldn't pay the fine anyway. So <laughs> it was a disaster. And um, he was basically condemned to perpetual exile and pain of being burned at the stake. And this was actually only repealed in June 2008. <laughs> 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 
took them a while to get around to it. Florence has issues. Wait, isn't there, isn't there like a tomb for Dante? Yes, there was a huge fight after he died over who got to suddenly reclaim Dante. Because, I'll get to it in a minute, but basically he's one of the founding literary figures of Italy. So there are two or three tombs for him scattered around Italy. One in Florence, one I think in Ravenna where he actually died, and another one where he lived most of his life I think in Verona. Though I'm not entirely sure, don't quote me on that. But um, anyway, Dante was involved in several white Gulf plots to try and take back Florence. However, they were all disasters. They were always betrayed by someone inside his own group. Basically, this was very depressing and embittering, and Dante turned into an extremely crotchety old man who hated friends and allies alike because they either screwed him over or were completely incompetent. Um, <laughs> it was around this time when he gave up on politics, because everyone was stupid, that he started working on the Divine Comedy, which is three books, 33 cantos, and one introductory canto. Cantos being sort of three line pattern in the Italian, and um, basically progressed to Dante's life really quickly. Traveled widely, he found some guy who was running Luxembourg, Henry VII, he asked him to attack the blacks in Florence to take back it, which he did in 1312, but no one's really sure that Dante actually had anything to do with it in any case, he died before Dante could get to Florence, and it was all a disaster. And basically the upshot of it was Dante didn't have much hope of ever seeing Florence again. Um, Dante went to Verona, lived with a buddy of his for the rest of his life. He later put that buddy in Paradiso, and thanks for letting him mooch off him for the, you know, all of his days. Um, in 1315, Florence had to grant a, grant a sort of mass amnesty to everyone. However, they still had to pay a fine, and they still had to come to public penance, and Dante still wouldn't do that. And so they reapplied the death sentence to him and his children in, in response to his refusal to do that. So Dante basically, despite always trying and hoping to return to Florence, died in exile in Ravenna after finishing the Paradiso. He was 56, and it was 1321. Okay, that's Dante. We're done with him. Now was moving. Um, yeah, I forget exactly what the disease was, but died of some disease. Everyone died of diseases. <laughs> Given it look very long. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't, by all accounts, much of a doctor, so. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the guild, Alec. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they weren't much of, they weren't pretty good doctors in those days. So, <laughs> that whole thing where he's like, I'm in the middle of my life. It's total bullshit. Um, no well, study. it was actually based on a biblical assessment of how long men lived. It was, there was, there was some part in the Bible where it, I think it implies that they live 76 years or so, and <laughs> theoretically <laughs> during the Inferno, he's half of that, and so, you know... He's supposed to be 35, I think. Something like that. I forget the exact number. I have it written down later. I know, it's, I was going to get to it later. But so yeah, it was about 35. Does that have any basis? Because people generally nowadays live that long, and so they sort of guess that that's the length you live? Or? What? I mean, it was in the Bible that those are the years given to man, even though everyone died younger than that in the Middle Ages. And then earlier in the Bible, they died like when they were 500. I don't, I'm not a biblical scholar, don't know much about the Bible. You'll have to talk to Hart or Neil or someone who knows those things. This is like very weak basis for it. It's because if you, like, if you don't, catch the plague or catch anything serious or more like Well, the, the reason he had this happen in the, his journey in the middle of his life was because there's a line in Isaiah, I forget the exact chapter, where it says, in the middle of my life I will descend into hell. So all of that was meant to sort of echo a biblical saying, this is how long men live, in the middle of his life, you, your life, you go to hell. Okay. So, divine comedy. It's so divided I'm into... Forward to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice to know. <laughs> Spiritual text. But, no. So the divine comedy is divided into... Three parts: the Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso. Inferno clearly the most awesome, so that's basically what I'm going to spend most of my time with. Um, the Inferno itself is divided into nine sort of circles and rungs in descending order, sort of according to the severity of the sins. And I'm going to use my handy dandy map of the Inferno to draw it for you, if I can. So, because the geography can get rather confusing, and the geography is attached to the different things that he thought were sins and how bad they were. So, let me see if I can recreate this doll. So, let's see. One. And by one I mean nine, actually. But, okay. This is not going to fit. <laughs> You can do another tiny one. <laughs> I could do another tiny one. Ooh, that was very small. Mm. There we go. <laughs> Satan. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. It's like... <laughs> well, what you should really just have is his legs. Yeah. Yeah. He's a three-headed monster. I'm drawing the heads. I'm 